people like this one. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank yes, you very we much want to, to thank our sponsors. Because they're making it possible. Absolutely. San Jose State University, Follett, Mighty Bell, and Blackboard collaborate. Nice. Oh, and here, okay, here's the where are you from. Uh, and uh, Margaret, if you don't mind, give all participants the whiteboard permissions for this slide. Uh, and let's just see um, how this, and I asked this earlier. Uh, oh, look at this. Look at the little dots appearing. And we'll see our friends in Australia show up here in just a second. And let's see what other countries we might have. There we go. Is that Hawaii that someone just selected? Nice. Oh, nice. I will be in Vancouver in two weeks to do a talk there. Eddie, Texas, wonderful. Nice. We'll take just a few more seconds here. If you haven't got to put your uh, your little star icon on the map, please go ahead. Marina, welcome. Welcome to your first Library 2.0 conference. Nice to see New York represented. Amanda, welcome. Nice. Okay, I think we will uh, continue on. Slide six. Okay, and the slides are there, so I'm going to dive in. All right, this one, uh, we had a little bit of a glitch whenever I think you jump from a Mac into a Windows environment. Um, <laughs> sometimes you get a little glitch. So here's the title slide. The title of this talk is Our Common Purpose, uh, libraries and LIS education in flux. So thank you very much um, for coming, everyone. And we're going to uh, jump into this, and we'll see how we do. Uh, I will say uh, a lot of this is a lot of this presentation is pulled from my uh, opinion column in Library Journal, which is called Office Hours. Uh, I this is my opinion type thing. Uh, this is sort of me uh, thinking and considering what's going on, and and just looking at the landscape of LIS education. So um, with that in mind, <clears throat> I'll start by telling you I was on the phone uh, last year with a colleague who is the, the, uh, the dean of a very large university library. And, I, and one of the things I always do when I, I talk to folks like this is I say, what, what should I be doing with my classes and my students to make sure they are ready to get jobs with you? And he, uh, he had a few things to say. And one of the things he said was, I want risk takers, and I want innovators, and I want people who are creative. And he went on to say, I want people who will work on projects and make decisions without waiting for me to tell them what to do. And it was very, very interesting to hear him say that. And it sort of helped me uh, make decisions about how I teach and uh, what I expect of my students since then. And, I, and again, it's really nice to have students uh, here with us in the room, and I hope we get to hear from them um, when we open this up for discussion. So one of the things we've been looking at in the last uh, few years is the concept of participatory culture. And uh, we can look to uh, Henry Jenkins, who wrote a white paper in 2006 on uh, education in an era of participatory culture. And he really defined what this means and defined uh, what it means to, to sort of live in this connected, uh, plugged in, and very uh, uh, collaborative uh, world. And he actually outlined uh, some of the affordances, what it means to be a participatory culture. And uh, I wrote about these for the San Jose Student uh, Research uh, Journal in a, a piece called um, uh, beyond the walled garden, and I looked at each of these, but what, what uh, Jenkins pulls out is uh, in this participatory culture, we have the opportunity for artistic expression and civic engagement, and that means that we get to share our creativity and we get to uh, engage with others. Uh, 
the sharing of course, and we can have informal mentorship as well. And I think we can actually see examples of that with the way that some of us might interact uh, on Twitter or Facebook or via our blogs, that there is some informal mentorship going on. And contributions matter, and I think this is key. And uh, I will say this to the students in the room, your contributions matter. The work you are doing now, for example, the students I have that are blogging and sharing their words, not just with me in a closed environment, but out with the, out with the world, absolutely, those things matter. To the practitioners in the, in the uh, room, absolutely, take a look at what the students are doing these days. It is, uh, it's wonderful stuff, it is uh, engaging and interesting and it's smart and uh, I think we can learn from it as well. And then of course we have um, our social connections. So let's take this a little bit farther then and talk about the connections we might make uh, with the, uh, the concept of participatory teaching. Now before I jump into that though, let's just uh, talk a little bit about online education and San Jose's program is 100% online and I think we do an excellent job of uh, using technology to our advantage to uh, sort of break down through some of these barriers. Uh, a few months ago I highlighted uh, in my column and on Tame the Web a, uh, a post by a young man named uh, Benjamin Lanehart who was finishing his degree at another online program and he wrote a post called, Is Online Education Still tuck, Stuck in 2001? And just sort of did a, a, a riff on uh, uh, how his experience was in his online program. And he says, here's what I do in my classes. I sign into Blackboard, I read the lecture, read the lecture quotation marks, read the articles, make my obligatory posts on the discussion board and occasionally write a paper. How uninspiring. Uh, he went on to say that there were days he felt, <laughs> he had, Shiloh says, boring, that he had learned more by participating in conversations in Twitter uh, much more than he did in a full semester long class. So that's something I think we need to wrestle with and I think we need to make sure that we are not doing, that it is not this rote, read, regurgitate, repeat, read, regurgitate, repeat, uh, this sort of environment that really to me does not foster learning certainly does not foster engagement and uh, to be frank, this does not prepare anyone to go out and work in the world of libraries at all. So uh, into the mix comes uh, someone that I really admire and that's Michael Resch who is a professor uh, and it just went out of my brain, I think the University of Kansas, nope, Kansas State, there it is. I know, he's great. He did the, uh, the video on uh, Web 2.0 called The Machine Is Using Us that is uh, uh, absolutely um, incredible and it, uh, I've used it in my teaching and I used to share it with classes. So uh, he made uh, the Chronicle uh, just recently in an article called A Tech Happy Professor Reboots After Hearing His Teaching Advice Isn't Working. Okay, now this is one of those headlines I think we come across that's kind of uh, uh, inflammatory or makes you want to read the article because when you read the article it turns out to be very interesting. Uh, it says that Wesh encountered people as he was going around uh, the world speaking, professors coming up and saying, well, I tried what you talk about and guess what, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work at all. And he encountered this, you know, many times. And he, he realized that a lot of people were just throwing technology at their classes or throwing technology at their students, like saying, oh, I'm on Twitter, yay, and then really not doing anything with it. Um, he says, it doesn't matter what method you use if you do not first focus on one intangible factor, the bond between professor and student. And that is more important than using the hot technology of the day. He goes on to say, my main point is that participatory teaching methods simply will not work if they do not begin with a deep bond between teacher and student. So, and um, Pamela actually said technolust, that, that, that is a really good way to describe this and we, we talk about technolust in my classes that maybe it's to, to, for a professor to say, oh yes, I use a blog and I use Twitter in my teaching, uh, blah, 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 but you know, really what are you doing with it and what is the purpose of it? And just like in libraries and I want to make sure that we're, we're hitting both uh, 
both sides of this, this coin tonight, just like in libraries, if we're doing technology for the sake of having cool, sexy technology, we're doing it for the wrong reasons. We should use technology to meet the mission of the library, and that's to help people find information and access what they need. So uh, absolutely the same thing for LIS education. So uh, I wrote about this. I wrote about this article uh, in a, a piece in Library Journal that became uh, the basis for this presentation called Our Common Purpose. And uh, I, I explore these ideas, and I really believe we need to give students opportunities how to, to, to learn how to engage actively um, with, with people. And that might be across a desk. It might be in the stacks, or it might be virtually. Uh, to find ways to facilitate people's interests and help them make connections to each other, uh, and to promote, of course, um, conversation and the creation of community. And uh, I think these things might be more important. And thank you very much, Margaret, for sharing that link. Very cool. Uh, these things might be more important than focusing in on the, uh, like the tool of the day uh, type things. But I will say, um, and just to put a real fine point on it, um, one of the things I do uh, is I do have my students blog, and uh, I have that has become sort of our community space and our community learning space, uh, and it's I think it's a way to to strengthen that connection that I'm looking for when when I work with my students and when I meet with them early on. Uh, I'm reading their words, uh, I'm reading the comments, I'm commenting. Uh, and I'm really, really impressed at how we can, over the course of 16 weeks uh, in this environment, and I'll tell you about the environment in just a bit, how we can create this space that also extends into Twitter, et cetera. And I'm not monitoring the Twitter right now, just so I'm not uh, super distracted, but hopefully folks are tweeting and maybe talking about this, and maybe some of my students are even using our class, class hashtags, class hashtags uh, for their tweets. So um, just a little bit uh, about my goals as an LIS educator. And again, this is uh, another uh, piece that I wrote for LJ. Um, I had the opportunity to, to sort of think about what I was doing with my students a couple years ago when I was invited to speak at the Educause Learning Initiative Conference. And uh, here's one of the things I came up with, to give LIS students environments for exploration and experience. And then the next, to immerse students in the spaces where they may work upon graduation. So we got two things going here. We have a space for exploration and play. And we also have a place where they will gain experience in the spaces they may work when they graduate. That's a reason, one reason, why I do not do anything within the learning man management system. Nothing wrong with the learning management system, but I want my students to have the experience out in tools and platforms that they may use. And uh, I've chosen WordPress, and I'll show you that in uh, uh, just a bit. And to remember that 20th century policies don't always work in 21st century learning and sharing spaces. So really think about what, uh, what needs to change from the way we did things in the 20th century. And it's, it's so easy for things in uh, education in the university setting to be place-based. And I think that's a really neat phrase that I've heard a lot lately, that things are place-based. For example, you may have to actually have a physical signature to do blank at some in, uh, universities. Um, that's place-based instead of maybe being able to submit a digital signature and a, a digitally stamped PDF or whatever. So let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the two classes I teach and the platform that I use. And I think we have some representative students from both of the classes right now. Uh, the first is called the Hyperlink Library and Emerging Technologies, Emerging Tech, Emerging Trends. Um, the hyperlink library is a model I've been working on for the last few years. Here's a, a word cloud representative of the course content and uh, of the model itself. Uh, the hyperlink library is based on sort of trend spotting and environmental scanning and futures research to sort of put, put together a model that looks at what uh, the future of libraries will be and what future uh, libraries uh, may uh, be doing with technology. So the platform uh, that we run 
is WordPress with the BuddyPress suite of plugins. I'm going to get real kind of medium techie for you all for just a second. I just want to tell you about this because I think it's a very, very powerful tool. This is a screenshot of the Hyperlink Library uh, WordPress installation with BuddyPress. And this is something I've developed with an incredible young man named Kyle Jones, who is like the, the technological know-how behind this. What BuddyPress does to a WordPress blog is it creates a miniature so, uh, social network. So everyone that has a user account on this site can have a blog, can have sort of a status update profile awareness type thing, uh, kind of a, almost a Twitter type thing built into the site. So everybody gets a blog, and then we also can interact via uh, sort of status updates and activity uh, check-in type things. This is the top level. You'll see I have uh, the main class blog feeds into this level. And the newest news, and this was a screenshot that I took just today, uh, was about the conference uh, presentation I was doing tonight. Because this tonight is our hyperlinked uh, library uh, learning commons time. And uh, we're sort of taking the time to do this instead. The other class is called Transformative Learning and Technology Literacies. And this uh, also, there's a word cloud for you. This cloud is based uh, partially on the Learning 2.0 phenomenon, the 23 things uh, uh, learning program developed at the Public Library of Charlotte-Mecklenburg County in 2006. And it's also based on an absolutely wonderful book, a couple of books, really, uh, one by Char Booth uh, called Reflective Reflective teaching, effective, no, effective learning, reflective teaching, sorry, and uh, a book called The New Culture of Learning. And Char Booth is absolutely wonderful, and the book is incredible. And uh, let me go to the next slide, and you can see the uh, very similar setup. I'm using the same theme. Um, she is amazing. Char is absolutely amazing. This class, uh, everyone is blogging as well, but we're also doing a, a huge, gigantic group project based around Learning 2.0. Uh, we have groups that have uh, self-organized. They have been partnered with a real life library. And for our friends uh, in Australia, we are actually working with two libraries in Australia. And my students are doing uh, Learning 2.0 programs for them. So this first part of the semester, they have uh, met virtually with a site liaison. Uh, they've utilized all sorts of technologies and social tools to put the programs together. They have adapted from what has come before, because that's the beautiful thing about Learning 2.0. And they have planned a five-week course of self-directed learning. We are right at the point that the libraries are starting to roll out the programs. So these next two are what will come next. They are implementing. And they will be uh, writing summaries and writing individual reflections on their learning process and on all the steps they took to put together these learning modules. Yes, uh, Lisa, it is absolutely like the 23 things. Learning 2.0 and 23 things, the names are on, almost uh, uh, synonymous. So it's been really an exciting environment, I think, both for the hyperlink library uh, group uh, and for the group taking on this huge, gigantic project. And I tell them, uh, and uh, I also wrote another office hours column about this, about embracing chaos. I tell them this class is going to be chaotic and messy, and it's going to be stressful, and they're going to be upset. And it's OK, because it will work out. And I think we've had some very uh, genuine and valuable learning coming out of it. So now I want to talk about, just briefly, some heretical thoughts about LIS education. Uh, pulled from the column and just some thinking I've done and some presentations I've given about this topic. Uh, again, uh, <laughs> these are my opinions. Now this came from the very first column I wrote, um, Office Hours. Uh, and uh, I, I think I got a little bit in trouble for this one. Uh, if the online world is not for you, then neither may be a career in librarianship. Um, I stand by this because I don't think there is an area of librarianship that cannot be enhanced by participating to some degree in the online world. 
Now, when this column came out, I think some people got kind of irked because they thought what I was saying is, you know, close the doors to the libraries and everybody go online. No, that's not right. What I'm saying is, yes, there will be some people that virtually do their jobs, and I think that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, there will be other people that partially do their jobs virtually. They're designing the website for the library or they're the, the digital services librarian, and they're doing all of those things with the databases and the resources, et cetera. But then there are all the people that are working the front lines and they're doing administration and they're managing libraries that can so benefit from participating in this gigantic online conversation that is taking place with all the, f the folks that participate in our profession. And way back when, and I'm reminded I have a, a colleague in the room that I was actually in school with, the University of North Texas, you know, w when all this was starting, we were just getting into blogging and and, and all those early things and what a little community we have. And it is still there and it is still going strong. Uh, so yes, uh, I really believe that we must understand what is capable with the online world and we should, to whatever degree works best for us, uh, we should participate. And uh, April, uh, yeah, one can't survive without it in today's world. I really, really believe that. Wow. Okay. You guys are saying a lot of cool stuff in the comments. I'm going to keep going. I want to give uh, want to give some time just maybe for some some shout outs, etc. Okay. So I used to teach the the intro to LIS when I was at Dominican, and this was face to face. So we were in a classroom together, and I would say to people, "Why do you want to be in librarianship? Why are you Why are you coming into this program? Because this was the first class they would take, and Usually, there were a couple of people in each class that would say, well, I like books. I like finding things. And that, you know, that's well and good. But I don't know if that's going to be the number one things we are doing as we go forward. I think libraries are, are evolving beyond these things. Not that there are not going to be books in the libraries and not that we won't be helping people find things. I, I think it will be much more uh, co-collaboration, uh, co-navigation. Uh-oh. Oops, sorry. One second. Had a little glitch there with the computer. Am I still there? Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> so instead of focusing on I like books, can we think beyond that? To what does it mean to help create local collections of the most unique stuff we have in our libraries and to share those collections out with the world and, more importantly, helping library users do the exact same thing? If you ask me what would be our, num our top roles in the future libraries, I don't think it's going to be dusting the books and helping people find things. I think it's going to be helping people create stuff. It's going to be helping people share their story with the world via whatever tools that we might have uh, available to us. And it's going to be taking the most cool, most unique things we have that we have, it's not the everyday stuff that every library has, but the most unique stuff and making sure those collections are accessible. Here's another heretic, heretical thought, and I apologize for the typo on this slide. I noticed it pretty late, and I decided uh, to let it go. <laughs> uh, LAS professors must understand emerging technologies that have transform, transformed information exchange. Uh, I think we have a little bit of a, a broad spectrum of, of adaptation of emerging technologies in our LIS programs. Uh, I think we have to make sure that as professors, um, that we are understanding and maybe to some degree using these technologies, just like I gave a charge to anybody going into librarianship that you should participate to a certain degree in this world. Uh, absolutely, I think professors should as well. And let me ask the room, I know we, I see we have about 50 people or so. Are there any LIS professors uh, with us today for this talk? Okay, I'm going to say that's probably, oh, okay, Helena, thank you. I teach a library tech program, nice. So um, 
we really, uh, absolutely, if you're teaching library tech, I think you have to understand what is happening with these tools. For example, I don't think we can dismiss the power of Twitter anymore because uh, just look at what happened in Egypt. And I was very lucky to be in a session where the, one of the librarians from the, the Alexandrian Library actually talked about during the uprising in Egypt, there were thousands and thousands of tweets sent and the library was able to gather all of those and save them. That becomes a very valuable, very interesting collection. And that's just one example of information exchange. We could call it information behavior, uh, even uh, crisis informatics to some degree, that that is why it's important to understand that tool. And I also think, and here's the, uh, the ultimate connected classroom, um, I also think we need to listen to our students. I think uh, they can teach us as well. I guess I'm not really, I don't have too many professors in the room to tell them this, but uh, absolutely, I think we need to listen to them and, and kind of take all of that in as we are sharing our own, um, our own knowledge and expertise. And isn't it, doesn't it seem like we've come a long, long way? Um, Helena, thank you for saying that. Helena said, I love learning from my students. Absolutely, I do too. And let me tell you, not a week goes by that I don't read a blog post um, from one of my students that, that really engages me or, <laughs> or whatever. And thank you, thank you for sharing that. But haven't we come a long, long way from those nights in library school, and maybe some of you will remember this, where the professor wheels in a cart of books and goes through, goes through them one by one to teach us about whatever like reference resources we're studying that week and then we're given the scavenger hunt and sent to the library to to answer all these questions to turn in the next week it, it just seems I don't know it seems so so quaint and uh, yeah it's isn't it amazing but that's what we did yeah the sca I cannot imagine giving my students a scavenger hunt now all right, okay, another heretical thought. Um, I think we need to end the disconnect, and this is totally anecdotal, totally anecdotal. I think we must end the disconnect between LIS schools and the libraries and their institutions. I, I Just from the people I've talked to, from the things I've listened to in the hallways at conferences, it seems that if there's a library school at the college, at the university, sometimes there's a little bit of a breakdown. Uh, I think we should partner. I think it, the, the library should be a learning lab and uh, they sh it should be a very strong partnership. And, okay, hold on to your hands. Don't get mad, to me. Get mad at me. Um, coasting in library school and if you're a professional out in your job is no longer an option. I never want to hear anybody say, I'm just coasting right now in my job. No, that does not work anymore. I was very lucky three weeks ago four weeks ago, uh, to attend a conference in Telluride, Colorado called the Risk and Reward Complex, R-Squared. It was absolutely the best conference I have ever, ever been to. And, and we, we uh, uh -oh. Michael, your audio has gotten really rough. Um, we can still hear you, but it's kind of strange. Okay, this okay. is this is the thing that happens that happen usually is like forty five minutes when you're starting with the these. I sound like I'm like I'm in outer space, sound like sound like our favorite. Let's just tell us you never think of a second in that. Yeah. It's pretty strange. You do sound like you're underwater or some kind of robot. Luke, I am your father. Have you ever figured out a solution to it? No, because it happens both here in Michigan and in Indiana. How about if I take away your audio permissions and give it back to you? Oh, nice. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, try it again. the talk button and try to start talking again. Nope. Okay, testing. Hello, can you hear me now? Better? Yep, thank you. Okay, we'll remember that. So <laughs> look at all the folks. Yes, thank you. Sorry, everybody. I apologize for that. Uh, so I'm going to go back just a little bit in case it got garbled. 
so we were we were talking about coasting, and coasting is not an option. And I clicked into this slide, and I was I wanted to tell you that uh, three weeks ago I attended a conference in Telluride, Colorado, called the Risk and Rewards Conference, uh, R squared for short. It was absolutely the best conference I have ever ever attended. It was engaging, and it was active, and we were on our feet, and we were learning. And I spent uh, part of my time um, in the customer curiosity experience track, uh, working with two uh, experienced designers from a company called Ricochet, uh, Ricochet Ideas. And John Bellina, one of the two men that were talking, he said, if we are not offering people something new, are we really doing our jobs? And that's one of the things I took away from that conference, that we do need to be focused a bit on new innovative practice and making sure that we are focused uh, sort of moving forward and moving into the future. So I think that's something good to think about, especially sometimes if you feel uh, that you might be coasting a bit. And absolutely, and Margaret says a really good thing here, sometimes that's hard to do in a current job, trying all the time, but not always welcomed. And I apologize for that. That is the uh, the downside of that sentiment. Uh, I also believe uh, that we should read and learn outside of our field. I think one of the things that R Squared did so well was they brought in people that were not library people. They were museum people. They were experienced designers. They were advertisers. Uh, they came from all sorts of interesting backgrounds to talk to us about what we do in libraries, and it just fits so well. Uh, the reading part, absolutely, uh, for sure, reading way beyond just library and information science publications to, uh, to learn more, especially about technology and how people are using technology. So here's the other slide that, that uh, got messed up, and I apologize for that. Uh, LIS, LIS schools must offer coursework devoted to planning, implementing, and evaluating the concept of the commons, both physically and virtually. That means one of the things we're going to be doing is we are creating the meeting place for the community, and that can be any type of a library. It doesn't have to just be a public library. It might be an academic community. It might be the community you're serving in a special library or the school library. So we're doing that both in the physical space, making the learning commons, the information commons, and we're also doing it in the virtual space. And that, that's looking at what it takes to create community, that's engaging people, and that's helping them to be co-creators and co-owners of the space. So uh, I think this is uh, key for the future. I gave this its own slide just to, uh, to reinforce the point that this is something that uh, I think we need to focus on. We need curriculum built around. Uh, working with uh, the folks in Salzburg last year in the Participatory Culture for Libraries and Museums program, at the Salzburg Global Seminar, uh, we define this as uh, transformative social engagement. And that will be something I think we will see more and more in our LIS curriculum. And uh, I already saw this mentioned in the chat. It went by. I think this is really interesting, this whole concept of creating in the physical space of a library and this sort of buzzy, but very important word, makerspace. We will hear more of this. So now's the time. Read up on it. Uh, this is something that also will find its way into our curriculum. I think we will have courses devoted uh, to similar things and probably to planning and implementing and evaluating makerspaces in our library settings. Nice. So here's a, a quote from a, a student uh, who said, I want a professor, I was uh, asking for feedback about some of the stuff I was doing, and this student said, I want a professor to throw me in a situation with his or her radical trust. Uh, I'm a very active, hands-on, real-world real world type learner, and I think our classrooms are lacking in this area. And I really agree. Uh, uh, Radical trust is important. That's that I'm not going to be telling you every little thing to do, and I'm not going to be looking over your shoulder or anything like that, but just sort of giving everybody a little nudge towards some resources and some, some things to think about, and then watching them experience, experience it, explore it, and sort of make it their own. Uh, absolutely, I think that's important. And uh, I see the, the, the little conversation there. Absolutely, I think IMLS has been instrumental in uh, 
helping with creation spaces, spaces, excuse me, uh, in the library setting. And Makerspace, again, something really important. And if you have an opportunity to do some learning around Makerspaces and 3D printers, that would be something just to pull into uh, your sort of your personal learning environments over the next few months. I think that we should have threads of technology throughout courses, not just courses devoted to the technologies of the day. Uh, I, I hope that we, that we, you get those throughout the program uh, and mentions of such instead of just uh, technology being scooted off into one or two classes. And of course, we need that balance, balance of the new skills alongside our foundational expertise, absolutely. So here's a really good example, and this is a Twitter capture. This is from Nick Jacobson, who was a student of mine in the Dominican uh, back when I first started teaching participatory librarianship and uh, the concept of Library 2.0. And I thought this was really telling. Nick says, I have done 5.5 sites at my place of work in the last 2.25 years, and nowhere in my job description is web developer. And he, he actually spells it out. He did three Drupal sites and 2.5 WordPress sites. So this is, as he uses the hashtag, and students, you know, take a look at this and, and put this in your brains, the new reality. You will be called upon to do these things. You will be called upon to, sure, go do a WordPress site for us. And you may have to say, wow, I'm glad I use WordPress in my classes in the Hyperlink library or whatever. Or you may have to say, wow, I don't know WordPress, but I'm ready to learn it. So let me ask you, this, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, and I really appreciate the, uh, the nice threads of conversation going on here on the side. I'm trying not to look at it too much. But what, what are your heretical thoughts about LIS education, about library school? And this, let's make this a safe space to share. This is just us talking and sort of exploring these ideas. So go ahead, folks, just type them in. We'll take just a few minutes, and I'll, maybe I'll read some aloud. Um, and tell me what your heretical thoughts might be. Mm, OK. Helena says, uh, in Ottawa, we're having library closures. We th we think we need to teach more information management. I think that might be a good thing to do. That kind of broadens uh, the availability or the the playing field for students. <laughs> but Google it good, absolutely. Oh, Pamela says, brainwash the resistors to leave. Oh, Lisa says, I find things that Google can't. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Helena. Yeah, that, Helena says, this is really interesting. Some students are reluctant to learn technology. I was surprised by that. This is where it gets kind of serious. And I don't mean to be su like a super downer, but if you're reluctant to learn technology, and I guess I'm saying what my slide said earlier, then I think you're going into the wrong field. Uh, and I think sometimes we need to like take people and say, you might be in the wrong place. I know that's kind of scary, but absolutely. Oh, OK, there are more coming in. OK, integrating unlikely concepts into the library. Yes, stop thinking the library is a repository. We did exercises at R squared on disruptive thinking and, and taking something like banned book weeks and turning it around. And what would make it disruptive? Yes, absolutely, libraries equal books. <laughs> Shiloh, go forth and make those radical changes. Oh, oh, this is great. April says, we are the catalyst that directs learners to obtaining information. I think that's really a good idea, that we can help people learn, and we can sort of be co-collaborators co uh, with them for these things. Boy, there's so much here. You guys are so cool. Unlimited opportunities to create solutions in this field. Susan, that's beautiful. I graduated just this last year. Now I feel so dumb. No, that's OK, Suze. That's OK. It's crazy the rate of techno <laughs> technology is increasing. One of the things you can do uh, about that is really 
hone your personal learning network and, and find the people that, that teach you, that you learn from, maybe virtually or the magazines you read or the, the conferences or the learning opportunities you go to, and just sort of keep, keep pulling all those things in and then uh, you maybe won't feel like things are going so quickly. Oh, absolutely. Joan says working collaboratively with other disciplines. I, I, will, I, I can see more and more of that coming uh, our way. Mm, Margaret says she graduated in May and already feel out of the emerging tech loop simply by not being a student any longer. Uh, absolutely. Okay. That says to me, here's what I think about that, is we really need to drive home in library school, and I would hope in many, many programs where people are doing, are serving the public and are working with technology, that you need, of course, to learn to learn. So that's that who you who you pull into your world and what you pull into your world that you constantly are learning from because um, we can't stop. We can never stop. Uh, librarians who hire also need to focus on less specific classes, software, etc., and more on evidence that applicants can think and learn. Nice. Well said. Are libraries even going to be around in a few years? Yeah. Uh, Cammy, I'm sorry about that. Sometimes when I'm on planes, since people ask what I do, that's, you know, oh, I teach in library school. Oh, libraries, are they going to be around? Oh, Nickel says, um, uh, make emerging tech a part of lifelong learning. Absolutely. And for everybody, for the people we're serving, um, that's what the library should be, that place, that community hub for, for that type of learning. Well, I really appreciate all of that input. I'm going to do a few more things and then, uh, Oh wow, we'll talk a little bit more. This is this is good. Okay, so thank you for your heretical thoughts. Um, just to wind up a few more things, um, for sure, and to bring it back to what Wesh said, um, I think we need to emphasize a focus on humanity, on humanism and the heart, and reflective conscious practice, not just jumping on technology, not just uh, jumping on whatever the hot thing of the day is, but really, truly reflective practice. And I think that goes back to a couple of the comments that we had uh, uh, just in the, the stream in the last couple of minutes. So sorry this slide looks a little odd. This is from Randy Posh in the last lecture. He said, there is more than one way to measure profits and losses. On every level, institutions can and should have a heart. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Libraries have always had a heart. I think we just have to remember that. I think uh, one of the most humanist things uh, out there is what can happen uh, when a, a librarian and someone who needs information come together. It can be a very positive thing. So what I would tell everyone, what I would tell the LIS professors uh, every chance I get, is to be human. Uh, I got to talk to a room full of the San Jose faculty last May, and this is one of the things I said. We have to be human. We are not just somebody that is grading a paper at the end of the semester, but we are working with people who want to be in our profession. Absolutely. Um, oh, yeah, the kindness audit is a super good thing to do. So this is, I think this is a great quote. This is Lawrence Clark Powell. He said, a good librarian is not a social scientist, a documentalist, a retrievalist, or an automaton. A good librarian is a librarian, a person with, a good, with good health and a warm heart, trained by study and seasoned by experience to catalyze books and people. We just might change that word books to whatever, information, knowledge, whatever we want to call it, and that is an absolutely perfect idea of what a librarian can be. Seth Godin said in a post about the future of the library, for the right librarian, this is the chance of a lifetime. Shiloh, you're right, you have to be a people person. Absolutely, and that might be encountering people virtually or physically in the, the physical space. So uh, I wrote about this, and I really was glad to get to talk with you all about this. Um, I really believe that it, both for library school and for what we are doing in our libraries, when we are reaching out and we're looking to create community and we're looking to reach people and we're looking to help them with their needs, that we need to establish a strong bond that doesn't begin and end with the hot technology of the day, but something much deeper and much more meaningful. And that's an understanding of our common purpose. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. So I will end with that, and I will open it back up to the room. 
for uh, questions. And Lisa has already put a question in, and I like this question. Do you think librarians of the future will be more extroverted than introverted? What a, what a great way to frame that question. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say typically, I think in the past, the uh, <laughs> April says they better be. I think introverts have found their way to librarianship. I'm an introvert, uh, even though I like to get up and talk in front of groups of people. Uh, I think we found our way to this profession, but I think that needs to change. And I think it's very interesting to meet the people in my classes that have maybe gone right through their undergrad and then they're coming right into library school because they know that's what they want to do. I think they might, on the scale, might be a little more extroverted uh, than, than other people. So I think uh, you, you may have to work at it. You may have to really pers push, push yourself to be an extrovert uh, in this sort of new landscape of libraries. Oh, Shiloh, thank you. And she got shh in the library today. Nice. Uh, other questions or comments or any other heretical thoughts? We've got just a couple of minutes, and I actually have another presentation uh, at 9 PM my time. So I, we may wind up here in just a second so I can jump into the next uh, next room. Oh, Helena, thank you. Nice. I will be back at OLA uh, in February. Nice. Carly, that's a really, that's a good sentiment there. It is a scary time, and I think we have to be really respectful of that, but I think we also need to model what is best for the future, and I think that's something that, um, that we can do. And I think I see that in my students. I see that in, in uh, the faculty that I interact with. Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> nice. Oh, nice. Terry shared a video. Grab that uh, URL. The, the introverts will dig this video from YouTube. Nice. I'm going to click on that, too. If I click on it, will it, hopefully it will open it nice. All right. Everybody, I think I'm going to go because I have to get ready for my next, uh-oh, my next thing. So I, w I thank you all for attending. And here's my contact information if you want to tweet me or email me or check out Came the Web or the San Jose SLIS program. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Have a wonderful evening and enjoy the conference. Thank Thanks, you, Michael, Margaret. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation. I know you have to jump into another one, so you get to chat some more. Remember that trick in case your mic goes yeah. funny. I appreciate that. That's something. Usually, it's just me alone in the room, and I didn't. I will do that from now on. Nicole just raised her hand. Uh, Nicole, do you have a question? Oh, she's typing. Now let's see what she has to say here. Nicole, I just gave you mic uh, rights. If you'd like to speak, you can take the mic. No, I think I, th okay. <laughs> I think she raised okay. her hand instead of you know applauding or something like that. Okay, that's, and that's that's cool. Job. Yeah, then sometimes yeah, I do that too. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to jump into the other room, um, and we can stop the recording, I guess. Uh, and thank you so much for your help. You're welcome.